How are we doing? What you listening to? That song by those Irish kids, have you heard it? No. Oh, hold on. I'll play it for you. So for context, a bunch of like primary uh, school kids in Ireland were allowed to make a song with a large budget. And they came up with an unironic banger. That's what I was jamming to. Thanks for asking, though. It's a, it's a good question. Yeah, they're not ready to film, but hopefully. <laughs> Hello, everybody. A uh, quick reminder that we are doing a fundraiser for specific things that I cannot mention out loud. However, if you want to find out exactly what it's about, you can go to the video linked right here. If we can achieve the fundraising goal, my wife is doing a face reveal by the end of June. Say hi, wife. Hello. Super enthusiastic. Just a reminder that that's something that we're doing and we're really trying hard to help that family out. We have already reached over half of the goal, which is amazing. And I really wanna keep that effort up. So thank you for that. And now to the video. So let me preface this properly. I have not caught up with campaign three at the time of recording this video. This is less a whole overarching view of the campaign, although I will get to that eventually once I've caught up, but it's more of a, here's my thought process from where I'm at right now. And where I'm at right now is at the time of recording this, I've gotten to episode 54 and I am actively watching as quick as possible, but it is a lot of content to go through, so please be a little patient with me. That being said, I wanted to talk about the main thing that I've heard nonstop through online discourse as this campaign has continued to air, and that is fan service. Now, for those of you who don't know, fan service is material added to a work of fiction that is perceived or to actually purpose appealing to the audience used especially in material of risque or sexual nature. Now, in the case of the fan service we're discussing today, it's not necessarily risque, though there is plenty of that in this campaign, Fear not. You know what we should do? We should all strip down and run through the woods. It'll be exhilarating. That actually sounds like a, a blast. I don't wear clothes. Yep. Listen, this is a this is a team bonding exercise. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Let's fucking go. Who's with me? I'm in. I'm in. I'll lead the way. You all right. Tell me how. <laughs> There you go. Let's just take off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we all get naked. We all get naked and run out after him. All right. So all of you just start dropping and running. Oh, uh, I will say everybody's everybody's clothes just goes into the portable hole, and Fern runs with the portable. Hole. But instead, we're discussing the other type of supposed fan service: callbacks to the previous campaigns of Critical Role. Now, to provide context, ever since this campaign started airing, this is the only thing that I have seen consistently consistently about the campaign. While I have seen ups and downs, the community seeming excited and not excited about the campaign, the one thing that has been a constant through line throughout is the complaints about fan service. Feeling like it feels less like a campaign and more like an event. Like they're trying to get people excited for Critical Role again, knowing that their numbers are dropping and so trying to find a way to increase that value once again in one way or another, this time through hype of fan service and cameos. This comes in the form of different characters from different campaigns being tied into this one, which is interesting because that's something that Matt very specifically avoided in campaign two. In fact, he's on record of actually telling Taliesin that he wasn't allowed to connect his character too much to the previous campaign because he wanted it to be something totally separate. And yet campaign three itself seems to be the opposite. It's like they want to connect everything possible. And this starts at the beginning of the campaign itself with Exandria Unlimited. Exandria Unlimited was a brief series that aired with Abria Iyengar as the DM, in which they played in Exandria, but in a separate campaign, a sort of short mini adventure with different characters. However, lo and behold, once we start campaign three itself, suddenly some of the characters who are a part of the main party were from that previous campaign. <laughs> Do you mind describing Fern? Yes, um, Fern is about a, a six foot tall fawn. Um, very, very long seafoam green hair, and um, is just covered in all bits and baubles and, and lots of flowers and toadstools and moss on her hooves. And she has a little friend, Mister, and he's a little monkey. Mm -hmm. 
And that in itself was only the beginning. Travis, at the beginning of the campaign, began playing the character Bertrand Bell, who wasn't even from the previous campaign, he was from the very first campaign. Or at least a side adventure where they tried to go find Grog and Travis had to play a different character. I feel like I have a good idea of where we're heading. Lead the way, Bertrand. Need... No, no. I'm a team player. It's time for you to lead, Leila. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. You know what? Mm -hmm. He believes in me as a leader, though. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. I'm in a good mood this morning. Now, let me back up a little bit. I haven't given too many spoilers up until this point, but I guess I do need to give a spoiler warning. Huh. It's funny. I, I haven't done one in a while, and I don't really feel this weight on my shoulders to do it anymore. Like, I have to do this whole extravagant thing. I don't have to go too hard on the editing. I don't have to try and play up this skit. It's just a spoiler warning, plain and simple. One day, guys, we should get Jay to the level of insanity where he morphs himself into the squirrel. And it's just this like creepy pasta version of him, but as the squirrel dancing. Alternatively, maybe I just won't put the squirrel. <laughs> I plan on cutting off that mid-sentence and just putting the most fucking stupid squirrel edit in there, by the way. Now, with that spoiler warning out of the way that I'm sure was incredibly tame and didn't get absurd at any point, let's continue on with the different cameos and repeated fan service that happened. Not only did that happen at the beginning of the campaign, but it began to become a theme. As things went on, we began to see even more cameos, repeated character cameos. We got to see NPCs from previous campaigns and mentions constantly about other places that were important. We got to hear a lot about Whitestone and and Vasselheim. And then it continued to extend even beyond that because we started to see more cameos. We started to see other characters. And this created this weird, well, the best way that I could put it is an MCU-like fatigue. MCU, if you don't know what that stands for, is the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the large overarching cinematic universe that Disney has created in order to maintain the Marvel brand as an IP. And in recent years, people have begun to grow tired of that because there's just too much content. And it's hard not to draw a parallel between these two, and I will draw back to this later, so remember that point, but I do think it is interesting. Now, initially, I really thought that these complaints had been established with some validity. There's been some concern of Critical Role trying to cater too much to their fan base for some time now. And frankly, the charm of Critical Role was how much the campaigns just felt like a home campaign. Sure, it had high production value, and the acting was amazing, but at its core, it was just a group of friends playing D&D, &D, and anybody watching could tell that. But the truth is, I feel strongly that this fan service is not actually fan service at all. I think it's still, for the most part, just a group of friends playing D&D. Let me explain. First, let's talk about the Exandria Unlimited characters and Bertrand Bell. Now, I know what you're thinking. They brought in characters from a side series. That has to be fan service, right? And to a degree, it certainly could be seen that way. I'm sure it could almost feel as if they brought in characters from that series just so people would feel obligated to go watch Exandria Unlimited and expand the Critical Role brand. This isn't just speculation either. It's a tried and true method of attempting to make a single brand all encompassing in order to hedge out competition and make that well-known IP that much more prevalent in the minds of the viewers. Like I just mentioned a moment ago, it almost gives that feeling of the MCU like multiverse, which is one of the largest reasons that the MCU became one of the largest brands that had ever existed, mind you, that entire concept. But at the same time, how many times have we heard people growing tired of too much content that is necessary to consume in order to understand what the hell is happening in the latest Marvel project? In order to get the full context of many of these characters, you have to watch a mini-series and a multi-session sword adventure from Campaign 1. And it's the same thing in MCU. How do I understand what's happening in this new movie if I haven't watched this TV show, if I haven't watched this different movie, and if I haven't watched the movie before that? And so you get this fatigue, almost, right? Like you don't really know what's going on, and so anytime a new NPC or a character or something shows up in Critical Role, you just kind of feel tired because you don't know how to really engage with that. You see that everybody else at the table is excited, but you're not quite sure why. And let me make it clear, this isn't just a problem for those who know nothing about the series. Um, I know Critical Role really well. Like I have a lot of content on them and have watched a lot of their content. And even I many times have seen them get excited over a character showing up and I just kind of sat there and went, who is that again? 
Was this important? I don't remember this. And to be clear, the MCU, because I am gonna keep making this parallel, was initially successful through the same model, but it too grew overwhelming. And a typical MCU project is two, maybe two and a half hours. A single episode of Critical Role, which airs three times a month, is at least three to four hours, if not more. So if people got tired of one, imagine how easy it is to get tired of the content from the other. So let's be honest, I, I'm just some dude with a camera and a room with no true experience on this stuff. And the Critical Role cast are, well, they're running their own company. They're playing these games, they're producing these videos, they're making the series we're talking about, so obviously they would realize this is a fact impossible to avoid. I'm not a super genius who's just figured this out myself. So what gives? If this isn't what they're trying to accomplish, and that is a big if, what else might be happening? Well, let's talk about it just a little bit more. Let's understand exactly what may be happening and realize that maybe they're not trying to be this MCU, but there's something else under the surface. Let's try and illuminate this, shall we? And Speaking of Illuminate, I would like to thank today's sponsor, Luminous Lore on Kickstarter. If you haven't checked out the Luminous Lore Kickstarter yet, now is the perfect time. This groundbreaking 300 plus page 5e art bible and setting guide features a unique dream magic system and over 10 new subclasses that allow you to manipulate the very elements of dreams and reality, which honestly is something that I find really, really cool and a, well, a whole concept that I explored a ton in the multi-year campaign that I just brought to an end. So it's hard not to feel a little bit excited about that and also like I sort of missed the boat on being able to use this content so don't miss it go check it out for yourself before you also miss that from battling celestial dragons to uncovering ancient artifacts luminous lore offers more than just gameplay it invites you into a universe where the dreams dictate the narrative itself and let's be so real out of everything that I put on my channel that's exactly my sort of vibe and I love it so much so click the link in the description and take control of the magical realms of Ecratoria. Equatoria, Ecratoria, Ecratoria. Ec ec I'm leaving every single one of those takes in here. And with that, thank you so much to Luminous Lore and back to the video. Now, in order to understand what might be happening if this is not all fan service and a big ploy to expand their brand, which is all that I've done to try and convince you that it might be for, let's talk about the larger perpetrator of accusations for nothing but fan service, the cameos. Like I mentioned at the beginning, Bertrand was already an important plot point and he was brought in clearly unorganically just to be killed off to pursue the plot early on. And then it only escalated from there. Keyleth was tied to one of the main plot points, in fact one of the large battles in the middle of the campaign that really kicked off the larger overarching plot was Keyleth getting curb stopped. Curb stomped. Curb, uh, she was getting kicked by a lot of people while she was down. <laughs> Add on to it that one of the main characters, Laudna, has a patron, which is Delilah, one of the main villains from Campaign 1. And then we get to see Pike, Vex, and Percy all play an important part in bringing Laudna back. And also, while Keyleth is getting curb stomped, Vax shows up to try and protect her and gets put into a Pokeball. Odahan goes for like a, a heart strike and there's a dark flash in the air. And you see where Odahan's blade was. Instead, you see a cloak of feathers. <gasps> oh, Jesus what? Fuck, what the hell? Black Raven Feathers. Wait, oh. throw the bingo! Throw the bingo! Is Vags on there? <gasps> you see a masked figure with long- SHUT THE oh. FUCK UP, MAN! Oh. SHUT UP! Oh. NO oh. FUCKING oh. WAY! Oh. YOU CANNOT oh. BE oh. SERIOUS! Where is it? now standing over and protecting oh. her body. Oh. Oh. Daggers in oh each God. hand. Oh. Don't you even dare. Oh. Already, that's a ton of stuff just from the first campaign. And okay, let's be fair. The first campaign happened a long time ago. So it makes sense that maybe they'd want to pick on stuff from that, but they certainly wouldn't bring up anything from, I don't know, campaign two, right? That's obviously too recent. You see a, uh, a female figure in this like hood that's up and kind of pulled in front, uh, kind of darker brown skin long sleeveless robes and uh looks to be like a staff affixed across the back <gasps> of, of the shoulders <laughs> what you both yeah is it both <gasps> yeah. why is it caleb and Bo? <laughs> best character 
<laughs> she will break her. Well, she's following Ludness's trail. Oh my god! Oh my god! Hey. Hey. Maybe you could have two different characters. Oh. 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 It's already happening up here. Fun time. So, yes, even characters from Campaign 2 show up. And while I've tried really hard not to get spoiled, I have seen some stuff from the Critical Role subreddit, of which I am actually very active on in an alternate account. The point is, I know that there's more that also shows up. And that list, I'm certain, will only continue to grow the longer the campaign goes on. And you know what? It does feel like it. It absolutely feels like fan service. I will not lie. And I was beginning to think the same thing until something happened while I was watching the show. I actually watched it. See, like many others, I don't really watch the show, I just listen to it podcast style. And because of that, I ended up missing out on something that I think Critical Role does so well, even over their competition like Dimension 20, and that's the constant access to the player's reactions. When I went back and rewatched many of these moments to get a play-by-play -play before writing the script, I saw something in the faces of every single one of them every time this fan service happened. Excitement. Pure, genuine, unadulterated excitement. Every single one of the players at the table were so absolutely thrilled to get to see these connections to their previous campaigns and the stories that they themselves built and were a part of. This wasn't a marketing strategy. It wasn't a ploy to get more views or subscriptions. It was a group of friends geeking out over their own shared history and lore. If this was a normal table of people, these things would be just as exciting. Imagine playing a campaign with your friends and bringing back a beloved NPC or character from a previous game. The room would light up with excitement the moment it happens, regardless of if you're on Critical Role or not. These moments are a testament of the rich story and deep connections formed over years of gameplay. It's the kind of excitement that any D&D group would experience when their collective stories intertwine in such really fun ways. It's a deeply connective narrative shared by friends who are passionate about their game. It might be fan service, maybe, but not in the way most people think because it's not for the audience, it's fan service for the very players themselves. These callbacks and cameos are a way for the players to relive cherished memories and celebrate their history. It's a personal homage to the experiences they had over the course of years getting to know each other and being deeper and deeper friends. And honestly, I think it makes the entire thing better. Not just the game, not just the show, the experience that they have with each other. These callbacks and cameos are thrilling for longtime fans, sure, but they're more important for the players themselves. And I think that is really cool. But let's also not ignore the fact that this is a show, and that's why this conversation has shown up. Because yes, it is just a group of friends playing D&D, but they've also marketed themselves as a show, and they keep doing this kind of stuff. And honestly, I think there are some very legitimate issues with this type of method. I've seen some people bring up a very consistent complaint, and I think it's really valid. I mean, these callbacks and cameos are thrilling for longtime fans, sure, but they can pose a legitimate challenge for new viewers. I mean, jumping into Campaign 3 without having any idea of any of the stuff that comes before makes everything less impactful, and now you wonder every time they get excited what even is going on, and maybe it's overwhelming and even alienating. This isn't just a minor inconvenience, it can create a real barrier to anybody trying to enjoy this current campaign. And I think it explains one thing that a lot of people have been attempting to dissect on YouTube and, well, basically any content creators who like talking about Critical Role for some time now, and that's why Campaign 3 is honestly just less popular than the other two campaigns. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Campaign 1 had the benefit of hype. Critical Role was growing as a brand then. And Campaign 2 had, you know, the world going into a pandemic. Everybody suddenly had a lot more time to watch this kind of stuff. But Campaign 3 didn't have either of those things. But on top of that, it also just makes it difficult for new viewers to appreciate it. And so, yeah, that is a legitimate complaint. It truly is, and I'm not going to ignore that. But consider this. We started this video with talking about the fact that this fan service might be a way of drawing people in. And now I've said that it might be something that pushes new people away. So which is it? And then we go back to what I originally said at the very beginning of the video. I don't think it's fan service at all. I, I think it's just a bunch of friends getting excited about what's going on. They've told hours and hours of stories with each other. They've spent this whole time telling this amazing story and now they're celebrating. And to be honest, 
Anybody else who runs campaigns like this should do the same thing. Give the players time to celebrate what they've created because one of the greatest things about this hobby is allowing the players to interact with the world, affect the world, and know that their actions have consequences. And what more is the further involvement of that idea than further down the line getting to see exactly what their interactions did to the world, getting to interact with that now. I don't see it as anything less than purely exciting and amazing. And so yeah, yeah, I don't think this is fan service. I don't think it's a marketing ploy. I mean, sure, maybe there's a little bit of a thought behind that, but I think ultimately it's a group of people playing a hobby, having fun with that. And that is why I think that they remain, despite being really difficult to get into sometimes because of the barrier of entry, one of the most popular shows there is on this kind of stuff because they're just enjoying it. And so ultimately the reason I wanted to talk about all this was to make one very simple point. It doesn't matter who you're trying to present to. It just matters who's at your table and if they're enjoying it. If they have fun, if they're excited, it's about your table. Don't try to be flashy, don't try to be a show, don't try to be anything more than what you are. Even if you do have cameras, lights, all of the above, just be you because it's the greatest thing you can be and let them experience being themselves and enjoy that all together. So frankly, is there anything better when playing this game? So, Go out into the world, make it your own. Never get to play a role. And listen to my wife as she gives the call to action. Um, support the... I, f I, flashed, I flashed the word up there. Thanks. <laughs> I don't know what I'm allowed to say and not allowed to say. And, um, bye if you don't like that. Like, let the door hit you and, like, knock you down a flight of stairs on the way out. Also, like, if you want to support the Kickstarter, do so as well. Like, comment, subscribe. Bye. Bye.